So music fans eagerly await new songs from their favorite musicians. Fans of athletes look forward to that next big sporting event. And history fans look forward to the latest production from Chicago history icon Jeffrey Bayer and his longtime producer, Eddie Griffin. Jeffrey Bayer is a seven-time Emmy Award-winning public television writer, producer, and program host. He has been a fixture on Chicago's WTTW for 30 years. Eddie Griffin is a three-time Emmy Award-winning producer, having produced the WTTW documentaries Chicago by L, Chicago on Vacation, the Chicago River Tour, Navy Pier Century of Reinvention, Century of Reinvention, there we go, Chicago Southside, and many others. The, your, uh, their new collaboration for WTTW is Chicago from the Air, a 60-minute special premiering Thursday, November 19th at 7.30 p.m. that takes audiences on a bird's-eye tour of Chicago's landmarks, neighborhoods, and suburbs shot entirely by drone camera. Gentlemen, welcome. Very glad Tommy, to be thanks here. for having us. So I'm sure it's not lost on you that you're doing these interviews uh, about this very outdoor project from a studio or at home with many of the interviewers uh, doing the same. Uh, has, has that been a little weird for you or have you gotten used to it by now? Oh, I think, you know, like everybody, um, we're all used to the, uh, the new reality, uh, which is going to be with us for, for a while um, and longer if people continue not to wear masks. So let's get that message out there. Yes, very um, true. But, um, you know, I think this program is sort of an ideal one uh, for the time that we're in. Uh, you know, we, it's it's the ultimate in social distancing, you know, from sh seeing Chicago from 400 feet in the air with a remote controlled uh, aircraft. Oh, I, I agree with the uh, friend of mine calls it the great pause of 2020. When I first read about this project, I thought this is a natural for socially distanced times. So who first conceived of this uh, and how quickly did it come to fruition? I think um, there had been some, you know, prototypes done across other platforms um, of, you know, typically were helicopter shows, helicopter over Wisconsin, over, you know, Europe. Um, that were just beautiful, picturesque shots of countryside set to music. Um, so when we started kicking around this idea, we said, you know, if, 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 if we use a drone, um, that'll allow us to get a little bit closer to objects and to, you know, to take the viewer, uh, to, to, to bring you closer to something rather than, you know, the distance that a helicopter, um, you know, limits you to. And then we said, you know, we wanted to take our, you know, Jeffrey Bayer history um, and, and really tell a story and really, you know, make this more than just um, beautiful shots, which, which it certainly is, we hope, um, but to, to tell the story of the city um, using the drone and, and really linking uh, everything together. So Jeffrey, you grew up in the northern suburbs, Eddie grew up on the south side. Did your childhood neighborhoods influence places chosen for this project? Oh, I think probably so. You know, we we try to be very equal opportunity with our shows, and and we particularly want to look at at underserved areas, areas that don't get as much attention or at least positive attention in the media. We also want to um, highlight uh, inequity um, in our um, in our in our region, but. You know, you, you can't help but sort of know about things uh, in the area that where, where you grew up. Um, so I would I would say there are a number of um, North Shore locations uh, in the program, although we also have the West suburbs in there and uh, and the whole several things in, the, in a lot actually in the South region of Chicago. Um, but I, I do think there is one example. Um, one of the things that um, I wanted to talk about was uh, a, a sort of a marker of inequity in our in our world uh, is the tree canopy um, in certain neighborhoods where you'll have in in um, more advantaged neighborhoods a, a lush canopy of street trees uh, and then you'll go to um, less advantaged neighborhoods or marginalized neighborhoods and all of a sudden it's um, barren very few trees and a lot of vacant lots and of course when i first thought of that i immediately pictured uh, Lincoln Square, where I used to live in Chicago, I lived for many years, has a very dense tree canopy. Um, 
And when I saw the, the footage, uh, Eddie chose to shoot it uh, where, Eddie? Uh, was that Beverly? Uh huh. <laughs> which is where Eddie's from. He's from Beverly. And so I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I guess there's a tree canopy there too. <laughs> well, you know, we really had a blank canvas with this show. You know, when we did the Chicago River Tour, you know, that show was going to be about the area in very close proximity to the river. Um, this was, you know, we could, we could go wherever we wanted to. We could fly wherever we wanted to. So a lot of the show was kind of born from, you know, looking at Google satellite maps and just seeing what does this, portion of the city, what does this look like from above? And, you know, being from Beverly, I, I took a, you know, I did a once over, um, you know, we're, Beverly is really close, close to the Dan Ryan Woods Forest Preserve. Um, and I had always known of the Major Taylor Trail, but had no idea of its story. So once we kind of, once I kind of looked over seeing, and you know, this is, um, you know, here, I, and I had no idea how far south it ran. So once you kind of got to see how, you know, how important it was, um, as far as like a, a, a repurposed rail tracks um, into uh, a bike path. Um, and Jeffrey, um, you know, did the research and found out, you know, more about Major Taylor himself um, as, you know, a, a world champion bike rider. Um, so we, you know, that kind of came from like, oh, what, what, let's see what this thing looks like. And then lo and behold, there was a whole story to it. So with all the amazing sites uh, around the Chicago area, uh, I imagine narrowing it down to a 60 minute cut must have been tricky. Were there any places that almost made the final cut that didn't? And is there a possibility, not to get ahead of things, of Chicago from the air too on the horizon? No pun intended. Well, there, there certainly were many, many things that had to, um, that we had to eliminate. We didn't, um, as far as I can remember, we didn't film anything that we didn't use because when you're filming with a drone, um, you know, you get up like 15 minutes of battery life uh, per flight. And, um, you know, you really, you really have to be very intentional about what you're gonna go up there and get. And so Eddie didn't wanna waste any days of filming. Um, <clears throat> so we did all of the, elimination of things in pre-production you know I, I i wrote a lot of um a, a lot of script material uh and then we would just look at it and, and you know the show can only be an hour so we would we would have to make some difficult decisions about what's in and what's what's out and of course in the process of that we, we certainly were already thinking about well you know if this show is successful there, there's plenty more out there that we could that we could film um so uh yeah i mean Assuming that uh, that that it that the show does well, and assuming that uh, there is there is funding available, um, you know, we would we would love to do another one. And we we really had um, we had qualifications for ourselves that we had to meet in order to put something in the show. Um, you know, it had to look good from the air. It had to be interesting. There had to be a, a reason to film it from the air. Um, so that kind of, you know, we want to, we obviously we want to cover everything and as much as, as we can as possible. And we do, um, we, we really try to spread out geographically. Um, but, you know, when it came down to it, it we had to ask ourselves, is this going to look good from the air? Does it make sense to film from a drone? If it's a, you know, a, maybe a great story, but if it's in a tiny storefront or a building that, you know, all you see is the roof, you know, we had to go with something that was visually appealing and made sense to shoot from a drone from above. And I would say that um, the, uh, the that tool of uh, Google Satellite View, especially in the three dimensional view, um, it's like the this whole new way for TV producers to survey locations. Um, and you'd be surprised how many things you would think are going to be great, and then you look at them on Satellite View, and it's just like a big white roof, you know, and you you don't really. It, 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 it's, it's not dramatic, it's just flat and ugly. Um, so, uh, and, and in fact, one thing we, I'm kind of just remembering this, Eddie, it's, it was so long ago that I, and we, we eliminated it so long ago, but I think we were talking about like shopping malls at one point. And we, we uh, you know, as a, um, you know, as industry a marker story. of- Industry in, in the end, yeah, in the industry section, the show's divided into three sections, the, the street grid, is section one, uh, the industrial Chicago is part two and sort of nat natural beauty is part three. Um, but yeah, right, it was in the industrial section like commercial Chicago and it just, 
you know, shopping malls are just these big white roofs surrounded by an ocean of asphalt. And it's an interesting story, but from the air, it just doesn't look like anything. Or, or the other thing I think we talked about, Eddie, was like, like um, distribution centers, like these Amazon right. distribution centers. You know, it's just a big white square when you view it from the air and, and not that interesting. Yeah, it seems like shopping malls, you, it's more of a ground level experience. So I can see how that would work. Even that's not a terrific experience. <laughs> well, pardon the editorial comment. So very true. So my youngest son is 11. Fortunately, he's a, a big Chicago history fan in no small, uh, small part due to the projects that you guys have put together that he watches with me. If, uh, if there are kids out there that aren't terribly excited about history, is there one segment in Chicago from the air that you'd recommend to parents uh, to show their kids to kind of spark their interest? Not only, Absolutely. Watching, yeah, not Absolutely. only watching the entire show, but, but Chicago history in general. As a father of uh, uh, now a, thir- a 15 year old, a 13 year old, but remembering when they were younger and what, what, what better for a kid than, than where does your poop go when you flush it down the toilet? <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the wastewater treatment plant, uh, the sewage plant down on this Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal in Stickney is one of the world's largest. Stickney, by the way, being almost an anagram for stinky. Um, <laughs> uh, it is, uh, you know, you can definitely show them that and uh, that, will, that, will, that will get their interest. Wow, I love that. Um, were there, uh, buildings or, or what buildings or areas uh, did you find were most rewarding, uh, from the air or is it, is it tough to narrow that down to just one or two? I, I think for me, uh, you know, from the producing side, from, you know, what it takes to get, you know, permission to fly, um, what we have to do, um, with, with weather, you know, we have, we're looking at forecasts, um, our drone crew, soaring badger productions, um, you know, they, they were, uh, amazing to work with um they know they know more about drones than uh, you know than anyone else in the city um so we filmed along the river downtown um and it took us you know three weeks to get it right um because of being you know the permits involved with the city um and securing everything um working back and forth with them and then waiting for the weather to clear we had you know two or three straight weeks where everything was beautiful sunshine until our the day we were supposed to shoot um and it's rain uh there's the second weekend it's like oh maybe we can get this off we've got a small window um and then when you look back and you say well we we're investing a lot into this this is a really crucial moment of the show where we, we want to show off you know the iconic buildings downtown um so you know we had to wait for a third week um for, for the weather to clear and then you know we wait and it's beautiful. It's some of the most amazing footage, Marina City, Aqua Tower, uh, the um, Vista Tower, Merchandise Mart. It was, it, everything looked perfectly uh, beautiful. And it, it was kind of like, a, all right, this is, this is why we waited. This is why we don't rush. This is why we have the time to do stuff like that um, is the, the big reward in the end. Again, it's the sign of a good producer. I actually had some tech questions uh, for you. And my first one was, did you need to get approval from uh, the FAA uh, for certain areas of filming or how, how difficult was getting permits for all of this? Yeah, the Soaring Badger, um, and they have a pilot and a photographer. Um, their pilot is always in touch with the FAA. Um, you know, it's, it's more along the lines of uh, the FAA puts out their notices, you kind of register your, your flight um, and, you know, it's just kind of yes or no, like, you know, that there's, you know, the president's in town or the motorcade is in town, they're, you know, or a, an NFL football game, Bears games, you know, everything is tightly restricted around that. Um, but, you know, once you kind of, you know, you, you register your flight and then, and then you're good to go. Um, and the pilot and the pilot is licensed. The pilot is, is a licensed pilot. So, you know, it, everything is done by the book uh, to ensure safety, of course. Um, but then also to not have to, you know, get to this location and then you put up the drone up and here come the sirens and someone's telling you to get down because you, you didn't check warnings. Um, that can, you know, that could really kill a, a production really fast. Sure. So you had the pilot, you've got uh, one other person. Uh, is that all the crew that... Uh, yeah, you know, and actually, I, I, let me explain one thing and then I want Eddie to continue. But um, just so people know, a drone is a small you know, remote controlled aircraft. So when you talk about a pilot and a cameraman, 
uh, camera person, they're on the ground right. with remote controllers and screens watching the device. Um, they don't actually, you know, shrink down to miniature size and fly on the drone. The drone is, it's a real aircraft, it's not a toy, but it's, you know, it's only, you know, it's only like this big around. Oh, you can't see my hands if you're listening on the radio. It's like, <laughs> it's like a, you know, three times the size of a dinner plate. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you could hold it in your hand. It is, it's light enough, but you know, it's, it, it's dangerous. It's got spinning blades. Um, it could cause some damage, you know, if someone was operating it who didn't know what they were doing. And that's why we take all the precautions we can because I, I, I realize that the most important thing about the drone is that it's also your camera. So if your camera is destroyed, then you're out of luck too. So next question, how many different drones were used to create this? And for tech nerds like myself, uh, what is the make and model of uh, the drone that was used? We, we primarily used two drones. We used the bigger DJI Inspire 2. Um, and that was, you know, it, it has uh, a shot 4K, um, beautiful picture. Um, but it's, it's bigger and it's, you know, I guess the pilot would describe it as it's, you know, it's more cumbersome. Um, so if you want to get in between locations, if you want to get into, um, you know, tight locations like downtown amongst buildings, uh, we would go with the smaller drone, which was a, a Mavic. Um, and that had, a, you know, a, still 4K video, really good quality. Um, but sometimes, um, you know, that it was, uh, you know, the, the DJI was, you know, the primary can, camera and then the, the, the Mavic, you know, we used to get into tighter locations because it's, it's less wind resistant, you know, it, it can kind of move. Um, you know, around objects uh, with, with minimal, um, you know, objection. So any mishaps while filming, uh, drone collisions with stationary or not so stationary objects, and will there be a Chicago from the Air bloopers video? <laughs> well, I'll tell you the biggest mishap that happened um, was um, we waited and waited and waited for this one day that we were going to shoot. I, I, in most of my programs, I only appear, I, I appear all over the program. Uh, I narrate it and I'm on, the, on camera. In this show, I am strictly the narrator, but I wanted to have, a, you know, one shot of me in the show. Um, just because, you know, if, if you don't recognize my voice, you might, uh, you know, you'll maybe see me at the beginning of the show and be like, oh, yeah, okay, it's one of those shows with that guy on Channel 11. Um, WTTW, uh, but um, so this was another, we, we, I wanted this shot where I'm coming out of a door and then the, the, the drone, it's sort of, a, you know, medium close up and then the drone just flies away and you see that I'm on the 75th floor of a high rise building overlooking downtown Chicago. And Eddie wanted to shoot it at golden hour, which is, you know, right before sunset and, and it's 75 floors. So it's 750 feet up in the air, which is really high for a drone. And um, we just kept not having the right weather. We kept having to postpone this shoot and postpone this shoot. And, and then it got to be the fall and the wind really picked up. And, you know, you'd, you'd plan a shoot and then you'd have like 30 knot winds and they'd, they'd say, yeah, we can't do it. So finally, we, we, we identified a day that was coming up on the calendar. We were going to be able to get the shot. And the day before, I went out to play catch with a buddy of mine in the park, baseball catch. He threw the ball a little off target and I ran after the ball and plowed straight into a pole and ended up with nine stitches in my forehead. And... At the uh, emergency room, um, I said, look, I have to film this, this scene tomorrow where I, 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 I don't want to see all these stitches in my forehead. And, uh, and they were like, oh, gosh, okay. So they, they actually sent me to a plastic surgeon who they thought could stitch it up more uh, in such a way, a little less visible. Didn't really work out, but uh, we, we, we figured out a way to sort of put some tape over it and I put some makeup over it and it's a pretty wide shot anyway. So you don't see it, but he's got that one was job to do the biggest. protect that mug. Yeah. yeah. He's got to keep looking pretty. And yet even, uh, even that guy, well, I don't know. You know, those of you, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to lean way in. You can, I'm a little Harry Potter here now. You know, this, the scar is, is still kind of there. I don't know if uh, your, your YouTube viewers can see that. You but, got the, uh, you got a good shaped head though. So I think it works out. <laughs> so it's, I, it's, as far as the rest of the drone, though, um, no, no, uh, no major mishaps. Uh, there was one instance where uh, the crew was trying to land the drone after a shot, and it had taken a little bit longer, so the battery uh, was getting low. You know, it's, it's enough to land it. Um, 
but at, it's about 25 feet above the air and the pilot says the landing gear is not going down and you know drones have landing gear that where the just the wheels uh you know just extend out um and again like i said the camera is underneath the drone so he's saying like i've got no battery this is coming down now and the uh photographer there it, the drone the pilot saying to the photographer you've got to go catch it um and so he <laughs> runs out he, he you know like the statue of liberty he grabs it catches it down avoids the blades he returns all fingers um and it was you know it was, it was actually cool to see it was just like these guys were like you know they knew exactly what to do the moment arose and they didn't panic um he, he caught it safely down and you know the footage was preserved and the drone preserved too all good news. So I know we uh, probably only have time for one more question. So I will ask you uh, one that I'm sure you've been asked many times before, but uh, I think it uh, bears uh, uh, another uh, go. Uh, if someone stepped foot in Chicago for the first time and wanted to get a sense of our history, where would you send them? Caveat, uh, you can't name a museum. Uh, I... You know, I don't know what Eddie will say to that. I have a, an answer that I think I often use, and it, it often seems to surprise people. Um, but I, I send people up to the top of Willis Tower. Um, and the reason is, although I don't know if you were brand new to Chicago, that it would be immediately understandable. But it also kind of plays into this. I didn't think of it till now, but it plays into this, this drone show that we're doing now. From up there, you can really see how the city grew and developed from the center outward. Um, uh, you might have to have it pointed out to you, but, but you can just see these layers of, of development. You know, you can see the earliest path of the river, you, you, you know, which is originally what brought people here. You can see the, the grid, um, which is central to the growth and development of Chicago from the, from the downtown outward. You can see how the lakefront has been reshaped. You can see how all the rail lines came in from the south. You can see the layering on later of um, the way uh, expressways um, altered the landscape in Chicago. There's just so much you can see. I think I, usually it, it really does center on the, the sort of commercial industrial development, particularly the way you can see the railroads and even Calumet Harbor from up there. Um, it, it, it really is a good way to orient yourself to um, Chicago. So I often recommend that people do that. And I would say you know, it's an obvious answer, but the boat tour, um, you know, on one hand, it's, it's if you just want a beautiful location, and you just want uh, to enjoy the sun, you can kind of just you can feel the breeze, you can go for a ride around the river. Uh, up and down, but if you really want to learn the history, if you can get a really good tour guide like Jeffrey um, or one of the other fabulous uh, uh, tour guides on on river cruises, you can learn so much. And you and it's architecture based, but you can kind of just kind of you can see what was important at what times throughout history and how um, you know how we would you know laugh at the fact that uh, you know 7,500 years ago people weren't. As, uh, as appreciative of the riverfront as we are now. And you can, you can kind of see how we're, we're returning to the river walk um, as far as, you know, just the river as an ap ac absolute asset for the city. So the boat cruise. And I'm, I'm gonna cheat and say one more too. Um, ride the L because Chicago, you know, is mo much more than the downtown. And, um, uh, you know, if you're new to the city, you kind of need to know um, where you're going on the L um, and be safe. But, uh, you know, last year, the project that Eddie and I did was the L tour of Chicago. And in order to uh, prepare for that, Eddie and I rode every single L line in Chicago from one end to the other. And you get a very good sense of Chicago um, from, from doing that. Jeffrey Bayer, Eddie Griffin, uh, WTTW Chicago from the Air premieres Thursday, November 19th. Gentlemen, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you, Tommy. Our pleasure. Thanks for taking the time.